It was not that long ago that liberal democracies behaved and acted as though they were composed of 50% citizens and 50% women, and perpetrated absolutely appalling injustices based on that claim. We think that in the same way that states have now apologised and paid reparations for all sorts of past injustices, they should now also do so for the greatest injustice of all, an injustice perpetrated against half of their people. Four things at opening government. Firstly, very briefly, what were those injustices and how did the state perpetrate them? Secondly, why past injustice links to women today and why they should be identified as the group that benefits? Third, why the state, and specifically men, should have to pay for those injustices. And fourthly, why this does compensate women. Briefly, what are we standing to do? Solve two problems. First of all, to repay the debt the state owes for past injustices, the things it has done in the past. Secondly, to help overcome the legacy that means women today are still worse off. In terms of a model, what do we say? We don't think we're going to give you precise numbers as to exactly how big these reparations should be. We imagine they will vary from state to state. That can be determined by tribunals. We like to call our model pay gap plus. That is to say, we will give all women lump sum payments on a fairly regular basis to compensate both for the pay gap and also for past injustices as determined by courts. But we think that we hope this debate will be about the broad principle of whether or not these, uh, these reparations are a good and just thing. We're also going to accompany this with an apology. Do we contend that all women are necessarily made worse off today by being women? No, but we do contend that a very large number of them are made significantly worse off, even if feminism has made some advances. For that reason, we're going to compensate as best we can. So, what were the injustices we're talking about? Two kinds of things. Firstly, injustices perpetrated by society where the state fails to intervene. We are thinking about all kinds of discrimination against women. Discrimination in the workplace, discrimination that meant they weren't allowed into educational institutions and into the professions. Where the state's failure to insist that all of its citizens ought to be treated equally meant that women were made concretely worse off. But secondly, we say, the state also perpetrated some very specific injustices itself by passing certain laws which materially disadvantaged women. It was not that long ago that in France, it was only in the 60s that women were given full voting rights. We also think things like marital property laws acted in a concrete way for the state to disadvantage women. Why do those past injustices link to modern women? Two broad reasons. Firstly, we want to say that identity ought to be considered in all of our basic political calculations. Why is that? Well, firstly, because we think states shouldn't stop caring about injustice just because they have stopped perpetrating it. And what we say is that women today are at the very least the closest thing we can find to repay for injustices perpetrated in the past. More than that, though, we think given that all individuals treat identity as a basic constituent of the ways they behave in society, that people conceive of themselves differently according to whether or not they are male or female, that always has to enter into our political calculations. No thank you. But more than that, we say the second reason that these things ought to enter in, to, uh, that, that past injustice links to modern women, is that they continue to, be, continue to be disadvantaged by those practices. Why? A few reasons. Firstly, because they were not involved in most cases in the way that ways that basic social structures were established, those structures continue to disadvantage women. We're thinking of things like the fact that the capitalist system contains a working day, which makes it very difficult for women to reconcile potential childcare responsibilities with also going out to work. We also think issues of self-perception, the fact that if the state made your mother or grandmother internalise an image of herself where she wasn't supposed to go out and work, that may well continue to reverberate down to women today. And finally, wider social perceptions were also affected by those past injustices and continue to be perpetrated. Yeah. Okay, well, my final point is going to be about why this makes women concretely better off. But at the 
the very least, we say all of those things are things that we currently introduce laws to do. Nothing in our girl policy suggests we're going to stop also trying to prevent present injustice. He will talk about that a bit more. So, secondly, why should the state and specifically men be forced to pay? Two reasons. The first one is that they continue to benefit in a very real sense from the past injustices I've just described. Firstly, because that's just a logical correlative of the argument I've just made, which is that women are made worse off by these structures. Somebody, we presume, is being made better off. We suggest that's men. But more importantly, we also want to suggest that moral debts are not the kind of things that states can cast off just because the people who were involved in those injustices, some of them, may no longer be with us. Why is that? Well, there's no point at which one generation becomes another generation, at which we can say that was just a past group of people and we are not them. Rather, what we say is that because the state is the locus of our collective moral actions as a society, we have to use it to apologise for past injustices. In particular, we say people cannot pick and choose their histories and which parts of the state they choose to be proud of. And if they're going to engage with present-day states which are founded on a whole set of histories, including the establishment of land and all political institutions, then they also have to take on the moral burdens that went with the injustices perpetrated by those institutions. Finally, why does this compensate women? Firstly, in raw financial terms, this is going to be a lot of money. It is going to close the pay gap, it's going to do a lot more. With that additional economic well-being comes a whole host of new choices that we think women are able to make in terms of their purchasing power, in terms of what they do with their lives. Note that we don't claim on side government that all injustice, it was necessarily financial or economic, but nonetheless we're going to adopt the broad principle as we do in all sorts of other forms of law, that we can sometimes compensate for things using finance even when the damage wasn't exclusively financial. Lastly, we suggest that our policy allows individual women to do things which reverse past injustice with the additional monies they receive. It allows them, for instance, to pay for childcare or to pay for additional education for themselves or their daughters that allow them to be better off in the workplace. Mr Chair, ultimately, this debate is about whether or not states can simply wash their hands of past injustices. This all-male Gov team stands to apologise for those past injustices. It stands to recognise them and it stands to do the right thing by society as a whole. And it is extremely proud to propose. Yeah.